Welcome to our Wagner Lab Cafe online. We have almost 400 registrations. Thanks a lot that so many people are interested in this exciting topic. My name is Alexander Biller, and I'm looking forward to share a lot of inspiration with you. Our topic today, automation labs, next level of high performance, laboratory automation is evolving rapidly end-to-end -end digital processes and device integration, mobile and cognitive robots, new handling tasks, sensor and analytics integration, and self-learning solutions such as organoid handling are making the field more diverse. The new technical possibilities meet the requirements such as sustainability, efficient use of equipment, the desire for ease of use, optimal integration into laboratory environments and compliance with regulatory standards. The impulses will address these issues and provide examples of where laboratory automation is heading. And we have really fantastic speaker today. I would say we have the automation superheroes in our round. Impulse number one is about what are the top trends in lab automations um, with Andreas Traube, he's head of department for laboratory automation at Fraunhofer IPA since 2012 and leads a team of 30 interdisciplinary scientists. He studied mechanical engineering at the University of Stuttgart. He's an absolutely pioneer in the development of laboratory automation by linking processes, technology and digitalization. Andreas, it's an honor that you are here to share your lab vision of the future with us. And I know you also have some news about Kevin. Impulse number two is focusing on the question, why are automated labs an important step into the future? With uh, Dr. Andreas Müller, he's senior product manager at HTE, the high throughput experimentation company from BASF. Andreas is graduated with diploma in mechanical engineering at Technical University of Darmstadt, Germany. After several years in process engineering, he changed 1999 to the Fraunhofer Institute for Micro Technology in Mainz, where he also obtained 2003 his doctor in chemical engineering. He joined HTE 15 years ago as team leader, technical development, and is member of the team new technologies. Andreas, it's a pleasure that you're on board to show your perspective to automation. Impulse number three is about how can we create lab automation to individual needs with Professor Dr. Volker Nestle. And Volker is head of product development at Festo Life Tech, chairman of the board at Hahn Schickard uh, Gesellschaft. He's an absolute expert for lab automation, innovation and technology management. And Volker, I'm also very excited that you're part of our event and I'm looking forward to see the possibilities of Festo and great applications. At the end, we have a Q&A session. So if you have questions, please write it in the chat. So I would say, let's start. Let's learn more from the automation superheroes. Take a good cup of coffee and be inspired. So Andreas, it's your turn. So thank you, Alexander, for this enthusiastic uh, introduction. And uh, I also welcome everybody uh, who joined today, uh, all the lab automation enthusiasts. So, and uh, I'm not so used to, to speak free, therefore I have prepared uh, some slides and you should now uh, see also the slides. Yes, I'm, I'm honored to, to show my perspective on this field and uh, to, to give you an impression what's my picture of the top trends in, in lab automation. So, um, to give you uh, an overview of my organization and of my background, Alexander mentioned it, I'm heading a team uh, which is working interdisciplinary at the borders of competences between engineering, between process specialists with several biologists in my team, and also software developers. If these three points are coming together perfectly, we get in the end also a perfect fitting solution for an engineer 
end users need. And uh, this is something what we are doing in, um, in public funded projects as well as in uh, direct collaboration with industrial customers. Uh, so we are able to, um, to engineer and develop um, top quality innovative solutions for uh, an individual end user uh, benefit. So, and uh, due to the fact that we do not have every day uh, a Waldner Academy Symposium on Lab Automation, we created about six years ago the Niklas Innovation Center, and I'm proud to say that Waldner is also a, a member of this. Uh, it's a place of ideation, implementation of testing. It's a 365 uh, open lab environment uh, to do experimentation, to do experiences with lab automation, with lab robotics, to uh, exchange on ideas and to to develop this. And I, I, I would like to invite uh, all of you who didn't uh, done yet, uh, the next Niklas Forum uh, is on, um, on June 30. So if you are interested, uh, go ahead and contact me and I uh, send you the information. So um, there's a lot of discussions how uh, the lab of the future will look like. Um, will it be disruptive by completely new technology, by completely new players we, who will entering the market? Or will it be more or less that uh, what we are what we have commonly in, in the lab environment. Will it be an evolution of technology, which uh, mainly comes from, from different branches? And the impression in the heads of the lab of the future is quite different. Some of the of, uh, are seeing their uh, completely automized uh, lab environments where the, the end user, the lab scientist is outside and the complete uh, lab work is done by robots. Uh, some are thinking already about mobile lo robots who are working jointly together uh, in normal lab environments with the people who are working there. Some are seeing there uh, still the manual lab workers assisted by a lot of uh, digital guidance some see new direct collaboration between uh, lab scientists and robots to do complex tasks together. And um, there is still the topic of miniaturization, which is, for my opinion, still very important to miniaturize lab process, to, to bring it to a microfluidic device and miniaturize a whole lab on the, on the, on the scale of uh, several nanoliters. So, but what is the tools? Perhaps everything, everything is the tools. And uh, the, the situation of the future of the laboratory is as diverse as the laboratory is itself. Uh, it's a complex environment, an environment where we have to handle different materials. Uh, the environments of laboratories are quite different. We are talking about a lot of different sample types. It's uh, simply completely uh, other if we are talking about chemical samples compared to living sample cells or if we have uh, some biosafety uh, things to assess. It's uh, something completely other if we are talking from uh, uh, a regulative uh, lab in quality assessment or a, a research lab. So it's a it's a wide field, and uh, by this the the processes are, are quite different. The people working there are quite different, and also the devices, as you see on the picture here, is quite different. And that's a, a complex task to to work with automation in such an environment because most uh, devices which are already existing and also the people who are working uh, in the lab are not used to work uh, together with robots and the, uh, the devices and also um, the, the, the sample flasks and the, the micro titer plates are not made for uh, robotic uh, gripping. And therefore an intelligent person has said, 
automation applied to an inefficient operation will magnify the inefficiency. That doesn't make me very optimistic, uh, but uh, since I'm doing this for more than 10 years already, I'm relatively optimistic that it can be solved and uh, that automation absolutely makes sense in a lab environment because there are so much different. It's, it's the reduct uh, benefits. It's um, it's the reduction of human errors. Uh, we have greater experimental rates, so a higher throughput. There is an improved safety. Uh, there is for uh, the pharmaceutical people in, in this plenum, uh, a faster clinical uh, translation if we use this. And uh, there is a higher efficiency if we use uh, automation. And there are more soft uh, limitations behind this. Some people say it's an innovation inhibitor. Some uh, workers in the lab have concerns that uh, it costs their job uh, because then the robot is doing everything. Um, there is uh, the problem that until uh, 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 an automation system is uh, existing, uh, that uh, it's already old and already new processes has to be done then. And uh, there's often also an overstatement of, uh, of laboratory. And to, to, um, to meet uh, these limitations, um, it's important to focus the automation mainly on routine applications, on applications which are ready for automation. It's important to plan the automation uh, and to integrate the end lab users into the planning phase. It's important to have modular architectures of, uh, of lab processes and of automated integrated devices. And it's important to have in an early phase, a planning phase uh, to, um, to think about performance KPIs and to do risk assessments on the, on the lab automation, to have a realistic pictures what's possible. And one uh, future trend I see absolutely clear for the future is that robots will conquer uh, the lab of the future and we will see in much more uh, labs of today robots in the daily work. So um, what are lab robots doing today? They are they doing handling and transports of sample flasks. Uh, they are doing pipetting, mixing, heating, cooling, and uh, it's um, it's if we want to automize uh, a whole process, it's, it's then uh, adopted to such big systems. Or and we see uh, benchtop devices who do, uh, for example, pipetting steps. But uh, I think there is much, much more uh, potential to automate uh, tasks in in lab environment. And to give you a first idea in your heads, let me show this short little video. Um, we call this a robot kindergarten. And what the robots are doing here, they try to grip relatively soft parts. They're detecting it with a camera. And the interesting thing behind this is that the control systems of each robot are interlinked. So if one robot is learning to grip a specific uh, part here, all the other robots uh, get uh, the possibility to do the same. And uh, if you have uh, looked on the video in detail, you uh, got an imagining how fast uh, the robots um, are becoming faster. Now think if uh, we try to uh, um, establish lab processes on site of, of, a, of a liquid handling or a robotic platform, uh, how easy would it be if uh, the systems would be interconnected with uh, other systems which doing main or less the same process and if the processes and the robots are learning from each other. So this is already reality and uh, this will come into lab environment uh, too. And we will see lab robotics absolutely clear for transport tasks and for process integration, but we will see it also for complex technical tasks for maintenance, for example. We will see it also for complex biological tasks and we see it absolutely clear for safety procedures and also for 
uh, remote laboratory works uh, where people are not available or something like this. And to do a first entry in this in this field, we have developed Kevin, our mobile lab robot. Uh, most of you already heard about this. I'm relatively sure. So Kevin is simply doing a connecting of existing laboratory devices and the equipment which is inside uh, the uh, the laboratory. Uh, it's not uh, this big step from a fixed mounted robot. Uh, the different thing is that uh, Kevin is able to move free inside a, a conventional lab room. It has its own navigation system. It can do sample or process preparation overnight or do a media exchange in the weekend. It's doing um, logistic support during the daytime. Uh, it's able to do uh, simple uh, support processes like labeling. Um, it's autonomous, it's safe, and it's designed to work along uh, to humans. And therefore, it makes it capable to work uh, in, in nearly each labs. And here you can give an, I give you an, uh, uh, an impression how Kevin is working. Kevin uh, is controlled by a, by a conventional uh, scheduling system. So here you see the, the doors opens automatically. So therefore, the scheduler has to control the door itself. So it's not Kevin who opens the door. It's an overall scheduler. And it's the same with the elevator. Also, an elevator has a control. And it's just a question of interlinking to um, to make Kevin moving from uh, one uh, one part of the building to, to another part of the building. So as mentioned here, Kevin is waiting until the person on this dual workbench is ready. Then uh, Kevin is moving to it. Uh, there is a prepared sample uh, to pick up and to bring to another device. And this is how Kevin doing this. Uh, Kevin is detecting with its camera its position and by these uh, these little tags which are mounted at uh, the gripping positions, the robot is able to find precisely uh, the gripping position, for example, of such a micro teeter blade. Kevin has an onboard hotel, uh, so he is able to to um, transport a lot of of different things, and therefore um, such. A, a blade can carry to another automated device or to another uh, workplace, or it can come to uh, to a um, to a lab warehouse and or or to to such a device which is which is going on. So here the same, and uh, as mentioned, Kevin has its own navigation system. It's easy to install. Uh, it's about a two hour procedure in a new lab environment to install Kevin there to do uh, the, the teaching process. And after this, uh, Kevin can then can used easily by, by the end user. It's an intuitive software uh, to do this. And uh, if you want to have direct contact to, um, to Kevin, I warmly invite you next week to Analytica. There you can see uh, the real Kevin on the, on the Fraunhofer booth. So, an example uh, what uh, Kevin is already doing. So currently five of these Kevins and its brother are already ex existing. So this is an example. It's labeling of, of lab tubes, uh, which is a procedure which is done uh, just before uh, the people are starting to work. That is something what we uh, have solved for an end customers use. Future trend number two, it's the software connectivity. I mentioned it for Kevin. Kevin is only possible to work if it's, it's interconnected to other devices, to other systems which is inside the lab, and uh, to integrate also the user inside of these um, of this integration. And for this, we need uh, an architecture which is similar to that what we know from industry, from industry 4.0. It's the discussion uh, to have several software layers, uh, to have an administration cells uh, around our, um, our single devices as a robot, as a liquid handling, and they uh, communicating um, 
a digital twin to the to the top layer and uh, on this top layer uh, it's the same with the software there the software can be interlinked like a limbs like a warehouse system like a process designer system uh, for this we created uh, laken laken is uh, it's a digitalization environment which combine combines different things, completely different things, but everything on a software layer, like sensors, like a speech control system, web apps, uh, AR tools, but also a control system of, of robots or control systems of devices. And by this, all information which, which are inside the lab are coming together inside this uh, Laken cloud and can be used interlinking. And uh, it's a kind of an operating system for a whole, for a whole lab environment. Okay, and the future trend number three, uh, it's that hardware and software will not longer be a, a solution for uh, the use for, for a process. Um, the process itself will be a part of the overall solution. So the combination of these three parts, we will have at uh, the lab of the mission of the future will be have uh, uh, a hardware part, it has a software part, and it will have as well uh, a bioware part. And that's what we are calling the biological transformation, the interaction of these three topics. And to give you an impression how this uh, is, is going forward, uh, by this lab automation will be used in environments which are completely new, new like decentralized production sites for the production of cell therapies it's basically lab automation which is used there um, and there the biological sample or the product is a part of the technical system it's a part of the production system which is going on and by this uh, we will get solutions for the healthcare of the future and that this is already realistic. Uh, we are in a, in a joint project together with a startup from California, Koniku. They uh, engineered and they developed a device for do, uh, yes, detection of, um, of, um, of, of different threats. It can be biological threats, but also explosive threats. And th they do it by using cells. And these cells has to be developed. And for the developing of the cells and later on for the production of the cells, we need lab automation. And this is the task where we help to do them, to do this transformation. So first of all, we started with an, a screening device for uh, developing the cells for them. But in future, uh, this device will evaluate and will go to, to be also the production uh, system for this Koniku core uh, smell sensor. And um, you see this in these generations of different um, uh, devices we have engineered in my teams. The IDOT, which is now belonging to, to this appendix, the single cell dispenser Oscar, the organizer, more and more the biology is coming apart and uh, we are already discussing about complex uh, analysis to combine this with lab automation and to make it simple to use this. So lab automation of the future will be user-centric, it will be interoperable and collaborative it will able to integrate new labware as a miniaturized um, lab on chip system. And it will also allow and trigger miniaturized processes like organ on chip systems. It will be bio-intelligent and it will be in most labs the standard tool for routine work. And yes, thank you for your attention. And for this, I'm finished. Thank you very much. Andreas, thanks a lot uh, for this great overview and exciting examples, especially, of course, Kevin. And Kevin is working around in a Weidner lab, of course. So um, uh, join Kevin and also Andreas at the Niklas Forum on the thir uh, 30th or on, on the on which It's the day? the 30th of June, yes. Yes, okay. The thanks last day of June uh, here in Stuttgart. Great.
So thanks a lot. I directly hand over to Andreas Müller. Okay, I try to share my screen. Um, um, yes, we, we also um, um, have uh, selected some some use cases for um, more application oriented um, uh, studies in the lab. I would first actually start with a um, short uh, company overview. Um, we are um, a daughter of the BSF company and located in Heidelberg. And we have uh, roughly 350 um, uh, employees on the site. And we are focusing on high throughput technology in catalysis, but also in batteries. Um, what our scope is uh, actually it's material synthesis. Yeah, It's also testing, scientific co consulting to customers. And on the other hand, we, we also offer um, um, the, the design and the manufacturing of, of test tricks, lab automation. And what the topic is today is actually workflow analysis. That means uh, to, to, uh, to, to check labs if there could be any uh, um, uh, um, acceleration of the research when, when using automation equipment, automated equipment. Yeah. And we have also a software suite that can assist there. Our workhorse is um, a test trick as shown here. What you, what you see in this test trick is um, in, in the center, you see um, it's the reactor itself. We have a parallel reactor system normally. It's normally up to 20 reactors, which we operate in parallel. We check the catalyst, catal, catal, uh, catalyst inside this, this unit, and we have gas and, and liquid dosing and analysis in the unit. Um, these um, reactors can be flow reactors. It could also be membrane reactors, micro autoclaves, and most recently we, we studied uh, electrochemistry. Yeah, that means research for fuel cells and and electrolyzers. Um, the use cases I, I brought with me is uh, the first one is uh, directly connected to one of these uh, workhorses, and we, we we had the task here to to connect. Um, the testing uh, um, equipment with offline analysis. Yeah, and that, that's demonstrated here in a nutshell. Yeah, we have a, a, a small mobile robot. We have the test trick, and we have a remote uh, um, analytic uh, laboratory. That means coming a bit back to to original discussion with, with Waldner, um, Alexander. I think we, we, we had that with you or with one of your colleagues a few years ago, and we started three use cases. One, um, an automated fume hut. Yeah. Another one, kind of a handling assistant in the lab, and the third one was uh, a mobile uh, cobot, which helps uh, to deliver samples from um, an automated test trick to, to an offline laboratory. And this one is the one we realized. Yeah, and this I will demonstrate here how we do that. First, um, you see a similar picture, maybe as we have just seen from the IPA. Um, it's it's a lab. The lab could consist of analytical um, um, level lab on, on, on the upper floor, then we might have um, a, a test trick, yeah, an automated test trick, and you might also have a wet chemistry lab. Um, it would be nice then to, to have all this knowledge and the data and, um, and test parameters in, in the same database. Yeah? And the idea is then uh, creating a feedback loop, knowing all this data, yeah? so reaction conversion, for example, yeah? and um, optimizing um, new parameters for new, for new uh, experiments. Yeah? And for that, actually, you need uh, data. Yeah, first data you need is um, process data, but um, you might also want to to know um, data from a dilution robot, which uh, is possibly necessary for um, your liquid samples. Yeah? yeah, you create during the test, and you might also have some um, data from a GZ, yeah, from an offline gas chromatograph. Yeah. And in order to, to, to enable that, you need a transport means. Yeah? Transport means, in this case, could be a mobile robot, like this one from KUKA. Yeah? Yeah? And um, th this, this is not uh, um, sufficient. Yeah? You need additionally someone, um, this was uh, called the scheduler in, in the IPA uh, uh, lecture. Um, we call it a, a fleet manager. Yeah? And this fleet manager is uh, operating the building. It opens doors. It, it calls the lift here. Yeah? And, and then. Um, um, Actually, it triggers the mobile uh, cobot. Yeah, yeah. The, the the center of the software we are using. We have a, a recipe controller. Um, in 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 this uh, uh, um, chart, you see uh, um, actually the recipe. This is dosing, um, testing, heating. Yeah, and this recipe can be um, um, actually organized using a pick and place uh, um, um, system by choosing activity blocks. Yeah, which you would then actually. Um, use your mouse cursor with and combine to complete workflow. Yeah? 
And one of these important activities is then, in this case, um, the MIR. We use an MIR system, not a KUKA. We use an MIR system for, 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 for um, delivering um, um, the samples. And the, 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 the cobot is then um, adjusted to arrive at a certain time at the unit, yeah? And catch, for example, liquid samples from the, such a high throughput uh, the test trick, bring that to the, uh, the, the um, analytic uh, laboratory, yeah. yeah. And that's uh, the, the, the actual uh, um, process. You have the test trick here, you have uh, liquid samples, and when you, you, you know that you have the reactors here, we would produce liquid samples downstream of the reactor and would uh, collect them in, in something we call an, an auto sampler. We have a number of vials in here, glass vials. These glass vials will then be picked by, by this mobile cobot and delivered to a dilution robot, yeah? which is necessary as an intermediate step before you can analyze these samples in the uh, analytic uh, GZ. Yeah? When we, we doing this, we are then able actually to, um, to, to, to start the feedback loop. That means we have the reactors here. We have uh, the samples, which we bring to the GZ. We would then analyze the samples. And this is shown here by um, demonstrating um, um, the, the different um, uh, fractions we, we, we have during distillation here. Yeah? When we then learn that maybe the conversion is not, uh, or the distribution of these fractions is not as we wanted, we would then in, in, in the feedback loop adjust uh, reaction temperatures and produce new samples here, yeah? closing the loop in such a way. Yeah? Yeah. That's the basic idea. And um, in reality, it looks like, um, as shown in this movie here, um, you see the test trick in the background, you see the dilution uh, robot, yeah? And um, I, I'm going to start this right now. So, um, as you see, this is in cooperation with our mother company, the BSF. Um, they, they deliver the, um, um, the robotic part. So it starts actually with um, the unit um, um, ex ex extending the, um, um, the auto sampler, which uh, um, delivers then the liquid samples. You see that the cobot using its cripper is then collecting the samples, and it has also something like a, I would call it a primitive hotel, maybe yeah, on 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 uh, its its uh, um, carrier plate. The samples are then they are of course barcoded; they get weighed, yeah. And the next station is then this dilution robot, and here the samples uh, get diluted. You see that we, we extract some liquid from one of the samples. Yeah. Bring this into another vial. These vials um, are then diluted samples, yeah, and they are um, back collected on the robot by using a magnetic cripper. Yeah, and this robot is then on its way to the analytic lab. Yeah. Um, we use the same kind of a uh, software um, uh, scheduler, yeah, which opens doors, uh, uh, co calls for the lift, yeah. And this robot is now on its way to the, the upper floor, yeah. And actually, in this upper floor, we have the gas chromatograph. So, so on that that's actually the final step we have, which we have realized. This is de delivering the samples to the analytic um, uh, auto sampler. Yeah. And that's, that's our method to, uh, uh, to, to close the loop, yeah. And that's done for this uh, use case, actually. Um, we think we have uh, the benefit of um, uh, using um, all analytic tools which are available and accessible to, to, to via interfaces to our software, yeah, that, that, that's normally possible. And you can actually operate 24-7, um, yeah, which is not the case if uh, during the night shift nobody's in, in the lab, yeah. And feedback loop is, as we think, um, something that can actually uh, accelerate research yeah, yeah, enormously. Okay, that's the first use case. And the next use case is, um, start this again, yeah. The next use case is a bit more um, process and um, let's, I would call it a, a single reactor unit, yeah. This uh, is something that's a bit different to, to our normal uh, um, test equipment. Here we have just one reactor. It's a batch reactor. You see, see it in, in the photograph here. You see there's a steerer inside. There's also something uh, which is a really big ball valve uh, at, at the exit of the reactor for, for, for um, applying different inlays to the reactor. Yeah? That, that, that's, that's the key actually for, for this uh, use case. And robotic will start from here, yeah, as, you, as you will see. 
Um, this is a complete unit. Yeah, um, you see it. It consists of a, a number of different racks, which is just feed. Yeah, liquid feed. This is something to 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 pre mix and condition um, um, the feed. Yeah, and once that's done, then you you bring it to the core of the the process, which is this polymerization reactor. And um, next to it is uh, the sampling robot, yeah, which is also used for for cleaning uh, um, um, the reactor. Yeah. And in a bit more detail, you see this on this slide. Um, you have um, on this uh, part of, of the rack, you have the um, the autoclave um, um, system. You have the big wall valve for, for the, which is which allows us to to enter into the reactor yeah, with some um, um, inlays. And this is the robot on the right hand side. Yeah, like you can operate it up to two fifty degrees, yeah, which is Normal uh, temperature range for um, uh, polymerization batch uh, reactions, yeah, and, uh, and a certain pressure up to 16 bars normally. Um, this part here is uh, equipped with an automated drive, which we use then for for the cleaning of the interior part of the reactor. Uh, maybe I forgot to mention that this uh, um, polymerization reaction is, is very fouling uh, intensive. That means um, you, you cannot ex execute um, a trial when you haven't cleaned uh, the, the reactor before the next trial. Yeah, And that, that's done then using uh, um, the, the, the cobot here. Um, you also have um, kind of a distinction, but I would call it a kind of a continuous process, Yeah, which is uh, ending with the, the batch reactor and the kind of a uh, piece goods uh, um, uh, processing, which is uh, meaning that once you have produced the product, this is solid then, yeah? so, so you can handle it. Yeah, You can get uh, liquid samples as well. Yeah, And so this is kind of a, a hybrid uh, uh, process design consisting of normally continuous uh, process engineering and um, um, piece goods handling robot, which we combined in one unit here. Yeah. So, and um, this um, reactor is on the overhead um, um, a part um, also equipped with a sampling unit, which is a syringe. Um, the syringe is also automated. That means we can um, insert the syringe into the reactor for, for getting liquid samples. Yeah, and um, on the downstream part of this um, um, robot, we have a, um, a linear drive. As I mentioned, this is used for uh, has has some cleaning jets. We can insert it into the reactor and it cleans then. And for doing that, we open this ball valve, yeah, which is also the, um, um, the sealing mechanism for, 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 for the pressure, yeah, yeah. And here you see some the, the, the cleaning uh, jets, yeah, which, which are moved yeah, to clean the interior part of the reactor. And the sequence actually is, um, first you produce, of course, um, a product, a polymer, yeah. You have a product inlay, yeah, which is then once that's done, actually extracted, yeah. And then you insert the cleaning inlay, which has the same outer geometry, yeah, it, but it's just used for cleaning. It has some hoses, yeah, to remove the dirt, yeah, yeah, the waste. And then you have a camera inlay, and here um, we, we we think the intelligence comes into play. Yeah, the the camera actually detects uh, um, if the, the the reactor interior is really clean. Yeah, and here you see in, in a camera view from the inside, from below, to the reactor head. Yeah, and in the movie, actually, um, I'm sorry, I forgot this slide. This is uh, actually um, a detection of uh, the interior part before the reaction. Yeah, that means that's kind of the, the clean reference. Yeah, and machine learning is then uh, um, using a kind of a differential image uh, creation between um, an autoclave lid, which is in this case here already polluted. Yeah, and it detects these impurities. And once that's done, and compared to the original uh, clean reference, it would start um, the cleaning process again. Yeah. yeah. And this cleaning process um, is going to start with um, uh, um, loading the reactor in a few seconds. Yeah. Here you see the, um, the reactor interior parts. That's the vessel which we um, insert. You see also the steroids integrated in, the, in this vessel, in this inlay. Yeah? So that means we, we don't remove, um, um, we don't leave the steroid inside the, um, the vessel because that's also polluted. We exchange it. Yeah. And that's now inserted. So in the meantime, actually, we prepare um, liquid sampling. That means that you have this, um, um, these syringes. They get inserted in, into the reactor head. And then we take the samples. Um, vials are prepared in which we inject our sample liquid. Yeah. This is done on this position. I think I speed up this a little bit if I can. Yeah. Okay, that should be done here. Yeah. 
Okay. Now we 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 re, re uh, um, call um, the syringe with the cribber. So now we can insert um, the liquid into the prepared uh, vial. And I, I skipped it. This part is just closing the um, the vial actually. So the next part is, is then that you you use um, the, the cleaning device. You also insert it into into the reactor. Yeah. Now this is done. Now this is inserted. Um, and the next part is the, the cleaning. It's Inlay itself. It's a bit difficult to see, but you could see that actually the liquid is, uh, is, is leaving uh, through the pipes here, the tubes. So now this is cleaned. And because I'm running out of time, I speed up this a little bit. Um, okay, this is brought back into position. And um, then the next thing is uh, we, we, we take out the, the protection sleeve. This is just needed to, to, to avoid that, again, you, you, you pollute uh, the, the lower part of the, of the reactor. And that's actually the end of the workflow. Yeah, and then this is brought back into its parking position. Um, yeah, that's it. Um, this is also, we think, a kind of a combination between process engineering and robotics, and it could could work to to, to speed up your your, your research in in, in R&D. Yeah, and that was my last slide. I guess I think um, I do. Thank you for your extension, and maybe you have some uh, some some questions later on. Thank you, Andreas. Um, thanks a lot for all these fantastic insights, especially also the videos. That's really great. Um, look to the time. I directly hand over to our last speaker um, in the round to Volker. So great. Thanks, Alexander, for uh, introducing me. And I hope you see my screen already. Well, uh, great to have you here and uh, giving me the opportunity to uh, present Festo as a, let's say, member of the live tech uh, family or world uh, outside there. You might know Festo as an automation company one of the automation uh, leaders in, in the world, actually. Um, and I prepared some, just some slides to give you an overview about the Festo mother company. But of course, I want to dig deeper a little bit into the life tech uh, where I am working for. And it's a pretty new uh, part of Festo and member of the Festo family. And we also have some distinct products for uh, life tech and uh, lab automation. Festo, you might know, as I said, uh, from uh, automation side, so factory and process automation is the core uh, of Festo, uh, more than 3 billion turnover and 8% in R&D. Just to give you a rough overview and idea, uh, quite a big company, and we have more than 300,000 customers worldwide and also uh, are uh, present in more than 60 countries and uh, around about 21,000 employees. Now, Industry segments also, uh, perhaps you might know Festo uh, most from food and packaging industry. So all everything that you can move something to automate, uh, uh, to pack uh, things, get things packed. Uh, also in electronics and assembly, um, we are uh, active in water technology, chemicals, also in automotive industry, all the processes for automating things in industry. And what's new actually for Festo are the two uh, new fields like medical technology and lab automation. And that's exactly uh, where the Festo Life Tech uh, wants to step into and wants to uh, contribute something. Yeah. So Life Tech uh, is, as I said, a quite new business uh, unit from Festo. We are now around about two years old, but uh, already have some decent growth. Um, we have around about 100 people uh, worldwide. We have two product lines I will uh, immediately um, introduce. 
uh, and we are already uh, quite international here. Uh, we use, of course, the sales in all over the world, the sales force from Festo, which is, uh, I think, quite an advantage. Uh, and we also have some decent um, turnover uh, reached in 2021. Now, uh, where are we active? And uh, I just want to uh, show you the pro two product lines where we are in. Uh, of course, we're talking today uh, on the right hand side about lab automation. Uh, and uh, here we have we are in all major processes of lab automation. So identification, we also saw uh, already some examples from the colleagues here. Uh, of course, dispensing, pipetting uh, are tasks that we want to fulfill and that we can fulfill with our products. And the whole liquid handling, uh, including like um, sample handling and also the liquid handling system itself, uh, we want to uh, contribute something. And on the other hand, we also have a second product line, which is about medical devices. So there's, uh, there we go closer to the patient. Uh, so uh, this is uh, three, there are three uh, focus uh, that we have there. So one is ventilation like oxygen uh, uh, concentrators or respirators. Yeah? Uh, we try to uh, bring in components here, but also uh, bring in our, for example, piezo technology, uh, valve technology into decubitus mattresses or dental chairs. So there are different uh, applications on the medical side. But if we dig a little bit deeper into lab automation, uh, I brought this uh, illustration here, everything that you see here, uh, you can get from Festo. So starting with a sample preparation and sample handling system like the H Gendry uh, above there, but of course all the access and all the additional functionality like capping function, for example, the right device, um, you will see how that works um, just for capping and decapping. Like this is the decapper, for example, uh, and uh, the, the idea is to fulfill the complete task of a liquid handler. So meaning all the sample preparation stuff, sample handling stuff, identification, decapping, as you see, but also uh, your aspiration and uh, dispensing here, like all pipetting functionality, dropping the pipe a tip, uh, then take another one from the tip rack and everything like that. So this is the basic, um, that's, let's say idea from Festo and uh, our offer to the market. Um, of course, there is uh, some competition out there. And of course, there are also some problems uh, with that basic, let's say, uh, construction here. Uh, because what you uh, uh, remark uh, immediately is that there are two systems. We have on the one hand side, the sample handling, like the mechanical and kinematics. Uh, uh, on the other hand, uh, you have the liquid handling and the basic tasks, uh, if we are honest, the basic task that you want to fulfill is uh, liquid handling. So you want to do something with the liquid and uh, let's say the sample handling and all the kinem kinematics around and all the automation around uh, the liquid handling, uh, meaning the sample handling is um, let's say uh, you need it, but you don't want to have it necessarily. And so we, we were thinking about what if uh, the sample handling and the liquid handling systems that you need to, to uh, automate a liquid handling, a complete liquid handler uh, could be coupled because they are coupled today. You want to transfer the, all the liquids also, but it could be also isolated at the same time. Now, this is a little bit contradictory, I admit, uh, but uh, this would lead uh, to um, several uh, advantages like uh, easy cleaning, for example. Yeah, You don't have any, uh, any rough surfaces or uh, problems with disinfection. Uh, you, you wouldn't have any mechanical friction because there is no, uh, no movement uh, and no abrasion here. And it uh, could also be a dust-free uh, environment, which would also be uh, helpful, especially if you have very expensive substances uh, or uh, if you need protected areas for hazardous substances or things like that. And of course, maintenance uh, in such a liquid handling system is also always a problem uh, if you get human inside uh, and human cells and uh, get uh, uh, particles in inside uh, this is it could just be a problem now we were thinking about that and you might already 
have heard about our ideas uh, concerning superconductivity. And I just want to introduce you some uh, samples also from the lab automation side, because we are also focusing uh, applications using superconductivity um, and using a new way uh, to move things uh, in the lab without uh, touching them. Yeah? And superconductivity means that we create a levitation by using a superconductor on the one hand and a magnet on the other, a permanent magnet on the other side. Uh, which leads then, uh, if you, of course, a uh, superconductor, you know, you have to cool it down, but you get uh, several uh, physical effects, I will introduce in a minute, uh, which uh, help you to, uh, to get a uh, system stabilization uh, of all degrees of freedom, meaning X, Y, Z, and also all the angles. And we will see how that works uh, in a minute. So what you can reach by using superconductivity here is a, a, com a complete separation of uh, transported goods, for example, uh, and the, the transportation system. So the, the goods are uh, independently moved from the transporting system, I'll show you. Uh, and there will be no contamination risk and the perfect isolation in terms of thermally, for example, but also, of course, and that's the main advantage probably in terms of particles. Now, what is behind levitation? Uh, superconductive levitation, uh, if we look at the left-hand side, we see a near dime magnet uh, that hovers uh, over a superconductor, which is at the moment cooled uh, down to, I don't think, I, I don't know exactly, but around, around about minus 190 degrees or something. Uh, and there you get th this Hoover effect, uh, this levitation effect. Uh, now, if we look at the right hand side, this is at uh, room temperature. Uh, the superconductor uh, has no uh, influence on the magnet field, magnetic field of this permanent magnet up there. So the, the gray, grayish thing is the permanent magnet and the, the magnetic field penetrates also the superconductor at room temperature uh, unhindered. So um, this is, not uh, superconductivity, but if you now cool it down, uh, and we will sh we will see a, a, a small uh, picture uh, later on, uh, a film. Uh, what happens is that uh, when you reach a transition temperature for su superconductivity around about uh, minus 190 degrees, uh, this magnetic field that you have uh, through the uh, permanent magnet is then bundled in uh, flux tubes and will be anchored uh, in the superconductor. And uh, so the, the field lines uh, can no longer leave the interior of the superconductor and couple then the magnet and the superconductor at a constant spatial distance which you also can adjust, by the way. Uh, so on the left-hand side, this is a physical example. It's cooled uh, with uh, uh, nitrogen, liquid nitrogen. And on the right-hand side, uh, this is cooled uh, electrically. And now let's again look, uh, have a look at how this uh, looks like in, in practice. So you have a cooling device and uh, uh, what we call the cryostat. Uh, bringing the cooling to the superconductor. And uh, then you have uh, spatial separation with such a spacer. And uh, up there, you have the magnetic levitation module, which uh, includes also permanent magnets. And uh, if you start cooling this thing down, um, the superconductor starts then uh, when reaching the transition tra temperature uh, to lock in this magnetic field. Yeah, and uh, then to, let's say, um, fix uh, the levitation module and you can take away the spacer and it will then uh, be able to hover above the surface, which is uh, at room temperature there. And then you can also bring a load on it. So, and you can then move around this thing with levitation. Yeah, this is quite uh, interesting. We were thinking, uh, uh, but what can you, the effect is impressive, and uh, you might have seen also different uh, physical experiments uh, how this uh, could be used uh, in in practice. And we were thinking about a new way of handling, and uh, I want to show it to you also how this could look like. So um, this is our small robot from Dialectics, by the way. 
Um, how would, it's, would this look like uh, when it comes to liquid handling? So if we have, do you, do you hear that sound? Sorry, I, I have to turn the sound down. Um, if you look now at this uh, lab automation application, you see the levitation of such a carrier, which might carry then a micro titter plate, for example, and you could also have uh, like uh, an a Z axis, yeah, so a vertical movement would also be possible without having moving parts inside uh, this space or this room where you handle the fluid, yeah. So this is the basic idea behind it that you um, can totally separate the liquid handling. Uh, there's no abrasion here inside, it's everything is done from the outside, uh, and also uh, by using wireless. Um, um, conductivity, you can also uh, bring in signals and uh, let's say a control, uh, the complete control via uh, wireless connection. So this is uh, the basic idea. And this is also already um, realized. This was a real example. And we were thinking, of course, also we are thinking uh, in, in further applications Yeah. And this could be, for example, using this uh, superconductivity with such, uh, these are supra cubes. So you don't need necessarily a static stationary device. You can also have a cube cooling down and transporting, uh, for example, micro data plates in such a spatial area. It's completely uh, separated. You can also have uh, contactless weighing here. Uh, and you can do dosing or dispensing pipetting uh, activities completely separated from the outside. Yeah? So there are no abrasions, no dust uh, inside this uh, hazardous, for example, area or easy to clean area. You have flat surfaces. You can seal it then again uh, and bring it to the outside and then take it, for example, away with we, all, by the way, have also a new uh, pneumatic cobot, which can, I can introduce the next time, perhaps. <laughs> uh, and this is the basic idea behind uh, the levitation and superconductivity with Festo. So, what we think um, levitation will be a part of future automation, not only in life tech or life science, but it can contribute something to the, bring something to the table, I guess. Uh, and we are really open to discuss your ideas. If you have any ideas using levitation for any automation task, please uh, don't hesitate to contact me. We are open to discuss and help you further. So thanks very much. That was it for the moment. Thank you. Olka, thanks a lot. That's really crazy. I never saw such uh, such uh, like like levitation. That's really cool. So if you have questions, write in the chat, then we can discuss and answer them with the, with the speaker. So Volker, a uh, question to you. Um, Festo is known as a market leader in, in the industrial automation. Why did Festo decide to enter the market of lab automation and medical devices? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, good question. Uh, and of course, it's like almost all time, it's, it's um, mostly market driven, yeah. <laughs> Let's say uh, the, the uh, capacity uh, or uh, growth uh, perspectives in, in classical automation is quite limited. Uh, there are lots of competitors and uh, I think we can bring to the table uh, many core competencies that are also needed in lab automation. So we can transfer our core competencies uh, in movement, for example, also in handling fluids, like not only uh, fluidic, but also gas. Uh, we have the components, we have the knowledge uh, to bring in. And of course, there are similar tasks in, in the life science area and we can use them and uh, make, use of, make use of it and bring in some innovation, uh, we think. Uh, and of course, uh, we also have uh, I, I uh, introduced that, uh, that we have a worldwide uh, sales force. We have also the possibility to be always close to the customer. And we know that uh, the, the business here in life science and lab automation is very solution driven. And you have to, you need to have as a customer, you need to have the, the contact to the supplier and we are close to the customer. And I think that's a big advantage. Thanks. So I have the next question to Andreas Traube. 
to bring you back to the round, um, Andreas, you showed us Kevin. Uh, he's moving around inside the lab. And what can Kevin cover today? And what is to come in the future? Can you say something about that? Well, today uh, Kevin is made for uh, for handling of SBS based blades. Uh, it can be adopted to other formats a little bit, but mainly it's done for transportation of micro teeter blades from one point inside a lab to another point of a lab and also outside of single rooms and uh, to move in elevators and things like this. Everything this is basically key basically can be done by by Kevin. Um, in future, there will come much more. Uh, we will we will see uh, different robotics on site. We will see um, other kinematics uh, on the top of the robot to that so that he is able to to do other handling tasks, for example, to open fridges, for example, to do handling what a normal human normally is doing, uh, to handle um, parts inside of a centrifuge, for example, which is still an exercise that is hard to automize. Uh, and yes, uh, and things like this, tasks like this will be done step by step and, um, and more and more will be possible. Thanks a lot. So um, the next question goes to Andreas Müller. Um, Andreas, What are the major obstacles when introducing automation in the laboratory, in your opinion? Yeah, that's basically the key question. <clears throat> um, um, normally, um, you, you wouldn't uh, expect at the beginning of an automation uh, process in, the, in your lab that everything, everybody saying, welcome and, and automate my, my, my tasks. Yeah? So this is We think um, something that has to be shown that is of advantages to, to your to, to your staff, yeah, in a way that it is um, expanding maybe the, the number of experiments you can execute, yeah. That means to kind of um, um, lower the daily workload. That's helpful, yeah. That's also welcome, yeah. It's something that needs to be avoided is maybe to 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 make the impression that. Um, um, the, the, that maybe the, the staff number is going to be reduced when you automate something in the lab, yeah. And that's normally also not the case, yeah. It's more a lack of, uh, um, uh, I would say, the number of experiments, yeah, which you need to execute, especially if you go, for example, for new um, um, developments like battery materials. They are lacking uh, um, new, new um, species of, of batteries and, and the variety of uh, um, material uh, um, um, research, yeah. So that's normally helpful, and um, yeah, I would say you, you need to avoid um, that. Um, and th th there's a kind of uh, fear of uh, losing jobs, yeah, yeah. But that's not the case, as, as I would say. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Another question to you, Andreas. Um, how would you initialize such a transition in a lab? Yeah, that 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 that, that is actually connected to the first question. Um, This initialization process is normally um, um, it works well when 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 you uh, when you analyze when you're analyzing the workflow completely using staff on site. Yeah, that means you 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 ask the staff you 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 guide in interviews. Yeah, you you have to analyze what is their their need, what what do they want, and um, also answer to um, maybe proposals they have. Yeah. And that's, that's normally helpful. Um, you 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 find um, bottlenecks in in process. You always do, yeah, yeah. But normally, people um, uh, daily operating in such a process, yeah, they can tell you the bottlenecks, yeah. And then you help them uh, um, 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 leading these this bottlenecks. And another thing is maybe um, th there is possibly a transition in in in, in lab uh, um, um, education, yeah, yeah. At least at the, in the BSF, it's the case, yeah. So that means you train new uh, um, lab uh, specialists in um, automated um, procedures which are on the market. Yeah, that must be known in, uh, in before they, they they start the job. Yeah, so they have feeling what what is uh, normal. Yeah, in the lab. Okay, thank you. Um, another question. I think that would be the right one for Volker. Um, Volker. 
what do you think is the benefit that Festo can bring to the table when it comes to lab automation solutions in comparison to your market friends? <laughs> market friends, a good expression. <laughs> Well, we are quite new in that market, as I said, and I think we can make use of our, as I also introduced, our core competencies. So this is not only on the technical side, but especially Salesforce when it comes to solution business, for example. And of course, um, we have a, a really strong and big company in the back. So what we can really deliver is quality uh, and endurance, of course. Uh, and also cost, we are cost sensitive, uh, bring down costs, try to bring, bring down costs because we come from automation where we have a much higher cost pressure than uh, in life tech or life science at the moment. And of course, we also have delivery. So we are able to deliver because we have facilities uh, to produce uh, components and, and all the stuff by our own. So I think uh, there are lots of uh, uh, advantages uh, when a customer decides for one or the, or the other supplier. Um, of course, you also can add uh, several suppliers along the value chain, but then there's lots of coordination. And what we try to bring to the table actually is to, to bring everything, bring the full solution uh, uh, to, the, to the table, to the customer, and be kind of a one-stop shop for uh, your lab automation problem. That sounds great. So I will build a automation city with, with you together. <laughs> And together with Fraunhofer, of course. And yeah. so the last two questions uh, goes to Andreas Traube. Um, Andreas, where's the biggest challenge for laboratory automation in the next few years? In the next uh, few years, uh, I think this mobile robotics task will, will come to market. Uh, it will enter the market. And uh, in a few years, uh, it's quite normal. Um, another thing I, I would forecast for the next uh, years is that uh, much more players than today are uh, will enter the market. Um, if I look 10 years ago, it was a relatively closed market uh, with highly specialized companies inside. And I see a lot of companies as, as Festo is doing, who, who entries, who starting their, their business in this field. And this makes it innovative and uh, they bring uh, new solutions. Also startups playing a, an important role there. So uh, the whole field is becoming uh, more more diverse and uh, the third big thing I see is that that the end user uh, will become an incremental part of the of the solution. It's not longer to to buy a solution from the catalog. Uh, simply said, uh, it's uh, to to define uh, a specialized uh, setup for an individual solution and also to, to get the solutions quicker uh, compared to the past uh, and not a monolite system, but a flexible system, which is, which is able to grow with the, uh, with the daily requirements. Okay, and the last question also to you, Andreas. Um, when will we have fully automated labs? What do you think? Well, if we if it's just routine, uh, then uh, it's able to see it relatively early. But uh, I think persons in laboratories are necessary, and laboratories are also uh, a field of 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 creation. It's a field of of thinking, and uh, there is no other environment where the uh, collaboration between uh, the people working there and the technology which is used there are working together. So I, I'm absolutely sure that in most labs, we will, we will see uh, also lab personnel in 30 or 50 years. Okay, thanks a lot. So um, I would say um, we close this uh, session. Thanks a lot to you, to our great speaker. Thanks a lot for so many animations we never had so much animations in our session that's a really great animation automation it needs animation so this was the ninth Weidner lab coffee online and the last before our summer break 
We started last October with this brand new series. In average, we had over 400 viewers per session. I'm so excited that so many people were joining us and made this form into one of the most successful lab series in the world. We are just preparing the next program starting in October. We will directly start on the 5th of October. So make a bookmark in your calendar about smart labs. And we will show much knowledge and best practice together with one of the biggest consulting companies in the world with Accenture. They have a, a special division which only make science labs. And that will be also great. And we also will have exciting topics like green lab benchmarking, lean labs, project reports, more future topics. So we will inform you as soon as possible, um, as soon as we have the details. So thanks a lot to our experts, to our auditorium, and see you in October or next week at the Analytica. Kevin is there. Volker is also Festo there at Analytica. Yes. And Walden, of course, is also there. Um, so I, I'm not sure HTE, it's not a fair for, uh, for you, Andreas. Um, I personally will not be there, but I think my, one of some of my colleagues might, might be there. Yeah. Okay. We have an analytic great. team um, in, at HE as well. They will be there. Yeah. Great. So see you at the Analytica or ladies in October. Thanks a lot. Have a nice day. Bye. Thanks very much. See you. Bye. Great session. Bye bye.